There are aspects of my brother's story that are particularly difficult and disturbing for me, and may also be for you. This episode contains some of those parts. Please consider this when you're listening and who might be listening with you. Eight days after John went missing, Sergeant James Walker sat at his desk at the Hillsborough Sheriff's Office without much hope. The organized search was over. Dozens of interviews had produced only one vague lead from a local girl. She'd seen two men with archery equipment recently hanging out behind the 7-Eleven. Somebody had reported two people who were archers, and they had seen the store. At the store, they had stopped at the 7-Eleven. How'd they know they were archers? I mean, they were carrying their... I think they saw either some of the clothing they were wearing, maybe, or saw the bow and arrows or something. Yeah. But I remember them being on the board as two archers, male. We were close with that. I'm David Kushner, and this is Alligator Candy. After the search for my brother had gone on for a week, my dad went on TV pleading for information. But Sergeant Walker wasn't expecting much. Then the tip line rang. Uh, Roebuck took the call, and I can remember the look on his face. Mm-hmm. When, and uh, I could see the intensity in his face and the look on his face. I knew it was a significant call. The woman on the line sounded nervous. She said her husband had told her that he had killed my brother. She said she had evidence, a patch her husband had cut from the boy's clothes. After John went missing, the police had released details about his appearance— Four foot 11 inches with wavy red hair, cut off jeans and a reddish brown shirt. But they'd withheld some things, including the patch, so they'd know if a tipster was real. Worried the caller might panic and hang up, the police got her location, a phone booth by the side of a road, and sped over to meet her. By the time they got there, though, she was gone. But as they were driving away, they spotted a woman on the side of the road with a flat tire. After they pulled over, they figured out it was her, the caller. Years later, one of the cops said, that's how the Lord works. Her name was Donna Witt. She was 29, a hospital lab technician. She lived across town in a trailer with her nine-year-old son and her husband, Johnny Paul Witt. At the station, she told the police about her husband. Witt was 30. He worked as an air conditioner repairman. He'd been discharged from the Marines a few years earlier for being unfit for duty. Donna described him as physically and emotionally abusive. One time, she said, after he got tired of her cat jumping at their pet bird, He shot the cat dead with a bow and arrow. Gary Tillman lived with them, too. He was 19, a friend of Witt's. Tillman had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia a few years earlier. And Donna said both Witt and Tillman had what she called people fear in them. Tillman had been living with them for about two months, and Donna told the police she had begun to think of him as family. On the weekends, Witt and Tillman would often go to an archery range near the 7-Eleven. The night before Donna called the sheriff's office, Witt had come into the kitchen after dinner and a few drinks. We don't have audio of Donna, but we do have the transcript from our interviews with the police. She told them. I was washing dishes then, and he started talking to me about hating people sometimes, or would I hate him if he had done anything? And I said no. Like many people in Tampa, Donna had been following the week-long search for my brother. Just that day, she'd seen a flyer asking for help and information. She even wanted to join the search party. 
but she worked nights and was too tired when she got off her shift. Her husband, Wit, was thinking about my brother, too. And then he said, you know that little boy that's missing? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know how it feels to sit at work and hear the guys talking about, I wonder where he's at or what's happened to him. And he says, I'm the one that done it. Like that, he told me. He was the one that done it. Witt told her that on October 28th, he and Tillman gathered their bows and arrows and headed for the woods near the 7-Eleven. Tillman would later tell police that they were going people hunting. They had a plan to kidnap, torture, and kill a child. It wasn't the first time they'd staked out that spot. They'd seen other kids pass through those woods, but had lost their nerve. This time was different. As my brother biked home from the store, Tillman hit him on the back of the head with a large metal drill bit, which knocked him to the ground. They gagged him, put him in the trunk of their car, and drove to another patch of woods a few miles away. When they opened the trunk, they realized my brother was dead. Donna said that after Witt told her the story, he got worried. He said, you're going to turn me in, aren't you? And I said, no. I kept trying to bring out more. I said, well, where's he at? And he said, he's in a safe place. Nobody can find him. I said, where? He would never come out and tell me where. He said he was in some woods and he was buried and camouflaged good. So then I started into detail trying to get him to bring out more. Like right now, I don't know if he's lying to me or what. At first, she wasn't sure if Wit was telling the truth. But then he showed her a patch he'd cut from my brother's shorts and the knife they'd used to remove it. So when I called this morning, I wanted to find out something before I come out and said anything. This morning, because if if he was picked up and it was proven he was lying to me, and then I had run, then he would do it. I wouldn't be afraid to say that if he found out I told it, he'd kill me. If either one of them really panicked, I think they would. The police got a warrant to search the trailer. They collected evidence. The patch, a dull hunting knife, a drop cloth, a bow and arrow. At 2.30 that afternoon, the cops pulled up to a shrimp processing plant in Tampa, where Tillman worked. They found him in the locker room and arrested him. It didn't take long for Tillman to confess and implicate Wit. Then he led the police down a desolate road where my brother's body had been mutilated and buried in a shallow grave. That afternoon, Witt was on the roof of a fast food restaurant working on an air conditioning unit. When he saw the police, he raised a pipe wrench over his head. The officer told him to drop it. For a minute, Witt stood there, looking around nervously. Finally, he put it down, and the police took him into custody. At the station, Witt asked the lieutenant to tell his wife he loved her. Then he sat down and wrote his confession. Okay, so it's Sunday, January 19th. 19th. For nearly a year, my friend Aria dated men she met online. Lots of duds, disappointments, and some disasters. But then along came Mordecai, and Aria fell hard. I opened the door. There was a woman standing there, and she said, I think you know someone named Mordecai Horowitz? And I said, oh... You better come in. In 2019, a friend of mine fell for a sensitive millionaire named Mordecai. And then she found out she wasn't the only one. It was way too good to be true. 
I'm Kathleen Goldhar, the host of Do You Know Mordecai from USG Audio. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. After the police found John's body, someone had to tell my mom and dad. The cops asked Espy Ball to be the one to do it. He was the psychologist who worked with our family. What they shared with me, and, and that they wanted me to share with your mother and father, was the basics of what had happened to Jonathan, and that was going to be really hard. Um, you know, part of, part of dealing with tragedies is that so often what you can do is to clarify instances where someone has catastrophized a situation and made it far worse than it is. But with Jonathan's situation, it was horrendous, and you could not make that look any better. That was the reality of what we feared. The greatest fear was the truth. His abduction, his murder. So I was at this friend's house. It was just a few blocks away. And um, I remember getting a phone call. And, and I think vaguely remember mom saying, you know, dad is coming to pick you up. And right at that moment, I felt like they found him and he's gone. When I came out and saw the car, I don't know, someone else was driving, but I think it was as SB Ball, dad was in the back seat. He said they found him. I don't remember him saying he was dead. I just remember him saying they found him and, and I don't know, but I felt nothing at first. I guess it was technically shock, but at the same time, I wasn't surprised at all. And I didn't feel anything until we got back to the house, which was only like a five or a six minute drive. And I remember going into the house and it was just, again, heavy, heavy and went straight through the back hallway to our parents' room and then just sobbing hysterically. I stayed for a period of time after that until probably people began to clear out. And so I was in and out. And again, trying to, to clarify something because you just don't cover everything at once. You can't process everything at once. I felt comfortable telling your mother and father that Jonathan didn't know anything after being hit. He would not have been aware of being in the trunk of the car, and he would never have been aware of any kind of uh, brutal treatment. I don't remember when or how or what I learned initially about John's death. All I knew was that two men in the woods had hit him in the head with a metal rod and he had died. And he wasn't coming back, ever. And something very awful and very public had happened to my family. Daniel Ruth, the young reporter who'd been covering the story, heard the news that night from his editor. They had found the body. And I immediately said, uh, okay, all right, I'll go, I'll go, where where they find him, I'll go there. Because I knew what he was going to say. I knew what he was going to tell me to do. And he said, no, 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 we don't want you to uh, go, to, we got that covered. We want you to go to the house. And I, my heart just sank. I thought, oh, shit, I got to go to the house. And so I went up. And I knocked on the door. Arnie Levine answered the door. Arnie was a friend of the family and our lawyer. He answered the door, and I had met him uh, in the courthouse. And he said, uh, look, uh, they're not doing interviews. And I said to Arnie, uh, well, I'm not here to do an interview. I'm here to uh, uh, ex express my condolences. 
And he said, okay. So I went in and your parents were sitting at that kitchen counter and uh, I went up to them and I said, I'm so, so very sorry. I wish I could write a more uh, happier ending to this story. And they thanked me for my coverage and they couldn't have been more gracious. And I said to them, look, you don't have to say anything, but there's anything you do want to say, I'll be happy to take it down. And your father started talking about how, how much he appreciated that all the volunteers, he just, he was a genuine. And as he's doing this, this firm hand gets clasped on my shoulder and it's Arnie. And he practically lifts me up and escorts me to the door. And he says, God damn it. I told you no interviews. And he <laughs> sort of gives me the bum rush out the door. The headline the following day was, Missing Kushner boy found in shallow grave. Volunteers gone. Now the morning begins. The funeral was the next day. I remember driving to, I guess, to the synagogue. You in the car, walking in. It's very fuzzy to me, very blurry. But it was packed. So many people. I mean, I remember I felt so self-conscious. And then, you know, I kind of vaguely remember walking in the synagogue, you know, down the aisle, you know, to the front seats. And just, I felt like literally a weight of people's eyes on me. It felt like a physical weight. It was just, it was terrible. And I don't remember the rest of the funeral. My family weren't the only ones reeling. The police, the volunteers, the friends, the press were too. The story had become so personal for so many in town. It brought up so many questions. How could you process such tragedy, trauma, and loss? How would we? How could we? How could anyone go on? There's this huge uh, pen of reporters, TV people and other print people, and we're all standing there taking notes, and the car pulls up, the limo pulls up. And your mom and dad and you and your brother, they, you all get out of the car, and you're walking into the synagogue, and your father looks over and sees me standing there. And he walks over to me <laughs> and shakes my hand and says, thank you very much. I apologize for what happened last night at the house. I don't agree with it, and I'm very, very sorry, and I hope you're not offended. And I said, look, I said, <laughs> you know, I'm saying to myself, my God, you know, this man and his family, they have more important things to, on their mind right now than my feelings for crying out loud. And I said, Dr. Kushner, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And then he says to me, we would like you to join us inside. Well, uh, I can't, I got to tell you, David, I've been doing this for 47 years. And I am still blown away by that gesture of um, the decency and uh, grace that he would think of my feelings at a time like that. Uh, I have been touched by that all my life. I remember riding the back of a black car to the cemetery. And I remember looking down into a deep, dark hole. I'm holding something in my hands. The little black pilot's book John and I used to play with. Someone told me to pick something I want to leave with John. And I chose this because it was everything. And he was everything. And he's gone. And I want him to have this so we can play forever. Then I watched the book fall from my hands. Into the unfathomable depths. Back at our house, the family and friends and volunteers who supported us during the search came together to grieve. John had been missing eight days, and now, for seven days, we joined for Shiva to say Kaddish, the memorial prayer. 
While we were mourning at home, within days, a grand jury indicted Witt and Tillman for murder. My parents were invited to speak at the sentencing, but decided not to. It just felt too overwhelming and painful. I didn't want to hear any arguments on their yeah. behalf. You know, I just, ugh. yeah. Recently, I saw pictures of both of them. It's very painful. It's too searing, too terrible to see their lives right in front of me. It's almost like it's easier for me to keep it abstract. I just couldn't do it. Witt was sentenced to death, and Tillman, because of his mental illness, got life in prison. Your dad and I wanted to do something for the community, in John's memory, something significant. They wanted to make something for the synagogue, and our family knew an Israeli artist who might be able to help. We had seen some pictures of what he, his tapestries were. Beautiful, biblical themes. So I spoke with our rabbi, Sandy Hahn, and I said, well, what should the themes be, Sandy? And he suggested the one about uh, the lion shall lie, lie down with the lamb for peace. The banner depicts a group of animals gathered around a child a representation of how the Tampa community came together for John. The other banner is called Jonathan's Covenant. There are two Cubist figures in purples and reds, their faces side by side. It's about the bond between the biblical figures, Jonathan and David. The two happen to share our names, but we're meant to represent the bond between all people who love and support each other. Stitched in Hebrew along the borders are the words. Jonathan caused David to swear again by the love that he had for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. On the next episode of Alligator Candy. I was never not willing to talk about it. It was so bizarre and so taboo and scary. What was taboo? Death. This episode was produced by Alex Sujan Laughlin with production support from James T. Green. Our executive editor is Sarah Nix. Lacey Roberts is our managing producer. Executive producing by me, David Kushner, along with Greta Cohn and Emmy Rossum. Sound design by James T. Green and Eli Cohn and Nocturnal Sound. Rick Kwan is our mix engineer. Donowitz's transcript was performed by Emmy Rossum. Special thanks to Jess Shane. Our USG audio team includes Jessica Grimshaw, Josh Block, Jennifer Sears, and Daniel Welsh. This podcast was inspired by my memoir, Alligator Candy. This is a USG audio podcast in collaboration with Transmitter Media. For more information, go to our website, usgaudio.com. 